so I'm very honored to, to be here to introduce him today. Just briefly, Leon Neal served in World War II, immediately afterwards attended the University of Georgia Forestry School. After graduating from forestry school, he formed a partnership with Herbert L. Stoddard Sr. and worked with him uh, here in Thomasville. He also worked with Ed Comerick and Henry Beadle. They, during that time, formed Tall Timbers Research Station, which I believe most of you are aware of, a research station uh, right out of Tallahassee. And he is also currently serving on the Scientific Advisory Committee of the Joseph W. Jones Ecological Center located on Itchaway Plantation right outside Albany, Georgia. Um, I owe Leon a, a great deal of gratitude personally because back uh, in my younger years, around late teens, early 20s, Leon spent a little time with me and uh, taught me what a forester did. And, and because of that, I ended up going to forestry school myself and making that my career. And for all my life, my father I always spoke about Leon. He, he spoke with him with uh, all the honor and integrity and the, um, referred to him as a naturalist and just had the highest regards for him for my entire life. That's all I, I've ever heard from my father on him. And since I've known him in the forestry career, I feel the same way. When Leon went to forestry school, you, you normally would think that a student goes to forestry school, he learns the knowledge that he needs there, and then he comes and practices forestry. But it's not quite true. Um, Leon learned an awful lot in forestry school, but he really learned forestry when he came to Thomasville and started training under Mr. Stoddard. And only then did he really learn how to manage timber, how to manage wildlife, and became the naturalist and, and forester that he is today. He learned how to prescribe burn, that's something they don't teach you in school. You learn the theory. You have professors that teach theories, but they, they haven't actually gone out and practiced the, uh, the art of application. He learned about longleaf management. He learned about the wildlife management. He, uh, he has a land ethic about him that uh, one of our founding fathers of forestry, known as um, Aldo Leopold, had a land ethic um, about him. He said you should always put more into the land than you take away from it. And I think Leon has done that, not only on his own personal properties, but for his clients. And, and a, a forester, not only he's got the skills and the knowledge of what to do, how to manage the forest, but he also has that ability to convince his clients that that's what they should do. And that's a uh, salesmanship ability. And he has achieved that just wonderfully here in Thomasville in the community. And so he's um, really a, a well-rounded, fabulous forester in that he's got the knowledge and also can apply it and convince his clients that that's what they should do. Um, there's a lot of um, difficulties in, in managing forestry, particularly in today's time. You've got the landowner's objectives. You've got the lawyers, the tax attorneys, the accountants. You've got the inheritance tax. You've got hurricanes that come out and change your management plans completely. And so you have all these factors uh, weighing on you. And you've got to, it's not just a matter of uh, managing the, the trees. And so Leon has, for over 50 years now, has dealt with all of these, these type people and convinced all of them of how the forest should be managed. And, and somehow has overcome any tax consequences and, and dealt with that also in his management. And so I would, um, I would like to compare Leon with Aldo Leopold, who was our father of wildlife ecology here in the, in the um, United States. I'd compare him with Gifford Pinchot, who was our German forester that opened up the very first forestry school here in America before he came Germans, of course, have been managing forests for over 800 years. Here in America, we're very young. We we're just started our forestry management within the last 100 years. And so Leon has uh, done that here in this community. He set an example for all the other foresters to, uh, to see what he does and how he does it. 
and to continue it. It's not, forestry is not just something that one man can do in one lifetime. It's an involving process. So if you would, join with me in welcoming Leon Neal. Thank you, Andy, and <clears throat> thank you, Tom Hill. I really don't think I'm going to say a word after that introduction. I'm going to let, you, let your imagination run wild, and I think I'll leave. <laughs> but I do, uh, do appreciate being here, and I appreciate all you being here. Uh, I know uh, 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 I, we've got a wide and varied audience here, uh, including a couple of people that I work for and a couple of people that work for me. And those people are the sawmill people in this room. They work for me, uh, one way or the other. They work for me. <laughs> but uh, it's great to be here. I'm going to give you a hodgepodge discussion today. Um, uh, I'm not a historian. I'm not a scientist. Uh, I'm not a. Uh, I'm not a lot of things. Uh, I've had a good deal of experience uh, in what I do, and uh, it's been very interesting. And it's interesting enough, I think, to share with you. I think you'll enjoy some of it. I hope you'll enjoy all of it. Uh, I'm going to try to teach you uh, some of the principles of basic ecology in the Longleaf Pine ecosystem. Uh, I'm going to teach you some, uh, some of the natural forces or show you some of the natural forces at work, uh, some of the human forces at work. Uh, so uh, uh, it's, it's not going to be too, too uh, to uh, structure properly, but uh, we'll jump around here, and I think you will enjoy it. So, Tom, we can uh, we can go with the slide. Okay. Please, uh, Hold forward. Just push your back. All right. Uh, this uh, uh, this uh, uh, okay. Good. We can't talk about anything regarding the natural environment in the in the deep in the southeast without talking about fire. Now, we also can't talk about a lot of the other ecosystems in the world without talking about fire. But we're going to limit our, our conversation today to uh, uh, to what goes on in the in the original Longleaf Belt, primarily concerning Thomas County and the immediate environs. Uh, the Longleaf belt, according to the uh, forest historians, it once covered about 60 to 90 million acres of land. Uh, it ran in the coastal plain primarily from Virginia to Texas. Uh, over the course of, uh, uh, of European man's uh, uh, development, uh, all but probably, and this is a guess uh, uh, from other people, there are about 5,000 acres of what we would call old growth longleaf left in the world. We've got a big chunk of that in Thomas County, and uh, we are very proud of it. And uh, and uh, you all see it uh, uh, without perhaps knowing it when you drive some of the public roads, but I'm going to introduce you to it, and uh, maybe we can take a closer look sometime. But fire is absolutely essential in perpetuating the longleaf ecosystem in a natural state. Uh, it's essential because uh, longleaf evolved under fire. So you can't just take fire away from it and expect it to continue to perpetuate itself over time. So with that in mind, uh, uh, keep that in mind during the whole presentation and we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk about it more. Uh, this is uh, uh, an example of old growth longleaf right here within two miles of where we are sitting. Uh, this is on Greenwood, uh, and I'm going to show you uh, several other spots. Uh, I'm going to list some properties. Uh, they're not all inclusive, but uh, we've got uh, original growth longleaf, old growth longleaf on, on uh, Greenwood, on uh, uh, Melrose Twin Oaks, uh, Mill Pond, all three Mill Pond properties have a little bit. Uh, the Wade track uh, is uh, a dedicated 200-acre track of old growth longleaf on uh, the Metcalf Road. I secured a con conservation easement on that back in about 1895, excuse me, 1885, from Mr. Jeff Wade. Uh, Mr. Stoddard had the concept of doing that, but there was no no easement uh, 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 situation available at that time. It was only later that we got into easements. 
And this was the first conservation easement in the Deep South. The Internal Revenue Service almost went nuts when we, uh, at Tall Timbers, when, uh, and with Mr. Wade, when he gave, uh, uh, gave this conservation easement. But that's a great vehicle to uh, perpetuate land in somewhat of a, uh, of a natural state. Um, this is a, another shot on another property. Uh, you can see the burning. I want you to see that. This is a little, little ecology here. Uh, this is a patch burn. It's, it's, not, it's done by controlling the fire on the basis of the availability of moisture in the ground cover. Uh, expert burners can do this. They can make a judgment call and, 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 and do it with no problem whatsoever. As Andy mentioned, not many people know how to burn anymore, though, because people are getting further and further away from the land. And that is a shame because uh, we can't lose, <coughs> lose the ability to manage land, which we have done to a great extent. But we can't afford to do that without losing the, uh, some of the ecosystems uh, that are dependent on fire. Uh, you'll see various stages of uh, growth after the burn. This is uh, an early spring uh, growth after a spring fire. Uh, this is uh, 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 further into the, <coughs> into the summertime. This is uh, uh, another uh, a shot of, uh, of, uh, of a beautiful forest. Uh, We've got, we can go on and on with this just to give you the diversity. If you look close, you'll see it might look the same, but there's different age classes in all of these pictures. And uh, this is a much younger stand of timber here that has all the characteristics of an old growth stand, but and will will eventually make it. Uh, the openings in the forest that, uh, uh, that uh, produce uh, uh, landscape scenes such as this, this is very important from a diversity diversity standpoint for all phases of the uh, of the forest uh, we try to manage for what we call a healthy forest and uh, a healthy forest is a forest that still uh, has all of the ecological forces at work in it including burning uh, but then it also uh, uh, has the structure uh, the diversity and age classes to, to perpetuate this um, if you don't burn, you begin to grow up to, uh, you have an invasion of hardwoods that is trying to, they're trying to come in all the time. If you don't burn, you'll, uh, you'll get hardwoods coming in. Uh, now, this is an old growth uh, longleaf forest. Those longleaf are about 200 years old when this picture was taken. Uh, you see the hardwood all growing up amongst them, and right in here, it might not be this thing. But there's a, a magnolia grandiflora, a big magnolia tree in there that, that is not fire tolerant at all. And it indicates that this stand has been out of the burning uh, program uh, for about 50 years, which was true when we took the picture. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, was deliberately taken out of a burning program because uh, the person that owned this particular property, the house was not far, far away and they did not like to see the blackened woods when they came down in the springtime. But this is what happens. You stop burning and the longleaf ecosystem goes from pine into hardwood and then uh, you, lose, you lose value, you lose a lot of things. Now, uh, let me back up a minute while you look at Mr. Gordon Simmons, who was, who was the dog man on Greenwood for many, many, many years. Um, when, when DeSoto came through uh, in the early 1500s, uh, some of the trees that you saw in those slides could possibly have been in the grass stage. They're longleaf trees, and longleaf, when they seed in, uh, the they seed sprouts, and, but there's no height growth made for several years under some circumstances on natural seeding that I'm talking about. Uh, the root system is building below ground, but there's no height growth. And so that's what we call the grass stage. And they can come out of the grass stage in two years, or they can stay there for 20 years. And, uh, and if ultimately they are released, they'll come out. Now, uh, uh, because of that factor alone, we've got trees on, on some of the properties that we know by actual count uh, are 400 years approximately uh, in age. If the trees stayed in, uh, in the, the grass stage for 20 years, they'd be 420 years old. So my point is that we got trees growing in Thomasville, Georgia right now that could possibly have seeded in about the time that DeSoto came through. And that's sort of awesome to think about, really. Now, uh, uh, when European man came in, uh, of course, much later than DeSoto to, to, to settle the country, um, Thomas County, 
uh, was broken roughly by the Oclockney River into two phys physiographic uh, regions uh, below the Oclockney and our in the Thomas County, lower part of Thomas County, and from there on through a belt uh, to Tallahassee. Uh, it's what we call the Red Hills region. It's, uh, it's sort of an upland, uh, uh, a lower Piedmont uh, physiographic region stuck down here in the coastal plain. Uh, it's been noted by the very earliest botanists that traveled through here, made that distinction uh, many, many, many years ago, and, and scientists uh, continually uh, uh, recognize it, and it's, it's, of course it's the truth. Uh, now, north of the river, we get into uh, uh, flatter terrain, uh, real good soils, a lot more bush distributed over uh, over the uh, general countryside in the form of small creeks, drains, depression ponds, and so forth. Uh, excellent timber growing property. There was long leaf there too. Uh, the site uh, was probably uh, comparable. Both sites were comparable, but. Uh, the, the northern part of the county was cleared in the earlier days uh, much more completely than the Red Hills section was. A lot of that was due to the fact that the terrain in the Red Hills uh, really prevented the, uh, uh, the farmers from, from uh, totally clearing the land. They cleared some land, and I can show you erosion ditches today that you can bury a small house in because without the uh, vegetation that occurred there, uh, when it was cleared and put into cotton and corn and so forth, they had tremendous erosion when the heavy rains came. So that's one reason that uh, we still have a lot of timber on the, um, below the Oklahoma River uh, of the older age classes compared to the uh, upper part. Uh, now, in addition to that, uh, you all know the history of Thomasville as a resort area. And uh, in the, in the sequence of events in time that control our civilization and our world, uh, the, uh, 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 the uh, people from the north came in uh, wealthy people that had the means to buy the land and uh, use it for recreational purposes and that was a formation in the late 1800s of the most of the of quail hunting plantations in the area. Now those people uh, they had one thing in common generally uh, and it, I'm sure it has to do with uh, their wealth and a lot of other things but they all uh, when they got their property when they decided to buy property and bought it and kept it uh, they love the aesthetics of the property, the experience of the beautiful forest uh, as a uh, background for their hunting and their recreation and their ownership uh, is what uh, was the impetus that made them not destroy their forest even when the forest became quite, uh, uh, quite valuable. In those days, of course, uh, the timber was not worth very much and so it was uh, uh, they felt it better to keep it and uh, rather than cut it. And uh, I'm glad they did because a lot of us in this room have benefited from that uh, one way or the other. And uh, so it was a good decision to make. It was a tremendous conservation measure. Uh, they, uh, they didn't realize it at the time, but they were preserving a part of the Longleaf ecosystem that is still intact today for all practical purposes. And it's not existing anywhere else in the Longleaf Belt in the condition that it is here. The difference is the other tracts of Longleaf, uh, old growth Longleaf that occur, uh, have not had the regular control burning for the last hundred years that the plantations in the Thomasville area have, because, and they burned uh, uh, primarily to keep the woods open to shoot quail. And so it was a great conservation uh, uh, measure uh, to uh, uh, this recreational use for the land. Now, uh, this is what, uh, uh, as you all know, uh, this is uh, an old picture of one of the Greenwood wagons. Uh, one more shot. They, they, they hunted two wagons uh, with a lot of people and uh, they're getting ready here. But uh, all of y'all can see the modern hunts and so forth. Uh, now, the, uh, the vegetation that occurs within the forest, all of, and I'm talking about forest management now, everything I'm talking about, whether it's way of hunting or anything else, is related directly to forest management in Thomas County, uh, on the parts of Thomas County. 
The vegetation under the undisturbed land we call virgin vegetation. It's not truly virgin anywhere because there has been some disturbance a little bit here and there. But for all practical purposes, uh, we have virgin land, and then we have the old field land, field that was cleared for agriculture and farmed, and that is old field vegetation. Once you destroy the, vir the virgin vegetation here, uh, you are destroying uh, a tremendous number of species on that particular piece of land, and it takes an awful long time in the state of nature for them to come back in. Uh, you start plant succession over again when you destroy, when you, when you clear land and plant, uh, uh, plant the crops, for instance. You're, you're bringing plant succession back to zero. Uh, in, in, uh, in nature, uh, you have certain plants that are the primary invaders of old field land. Then uh, you go through a period when they develop and then others add it and those pass out until after, I don't know how long, after, uh, you know, after a long period of time, you would get back to the original virgin land again. Uh, there are a lot of plants that occur there that are indicators of virgin land. In other words, if you destroy those plants, uh, it will be a very long time before they will come back on their own uh, due to their life histories. Uh, uh, without, now I'm not talking about restoration, I'm talking about a natural regeneration of plants. One of them is a, a little oak tree. It's called Orcus pumula. Pumula means small. Uh, this is a true oak tree with a normal size acorn. Very good wildlife feed, one of the best wildlife feeds there is. Turkeys, deer, quail, uh, and all, a lot of other uh, wildlife uh, uh, utilize these, <coughs> these acorns. Now, Quercus pumula is a tree, an oak tree, that evolved in the Longleaf ecosystem under fire. And fire kept pruning it off at the ground, but it sprouts back and it prunes off at all. I don't know how many years it took, it might have taken a, a, whatever, in the, in the process of evolution. This tree grows underground. As Angus Golson says, it, the trunk is underground and, and the, the top of uh, what comes up above, the, the limbs that come up above ground, they never get more than a couple of feet high unless you stop burning and they might get up to four or five feet before they're crowded out and disappear. But it's a tree dwarfed by fire and, uh, and, and it fits into the system very well. Another one is, is a chinkapin that is a dwarf chinkapin. Uh, this is a castina pumula made in small chinkapin. And it, the life history of that is very, very, the very same. <clears throat> this is ryegrass. As you can see, uh, with the color in the, uh, in the scrub oaks that are a natural part of this uh, type, uh, is in the fall of the year. This uh, is on the way track. Uh, we put a, a warm season burn out there, one June or July or sometime like that. And uh, the scientists have found out in the last 20 or 30 years that if you burn wild grass in the summertime, it will put up seed heads uh, in a tremendous way, and the seed are, are viable. It makes viable seed if you burn it. Basically, I think it's the latter part of May and June and early July is when the seed are most viable. Well, uh, that coincides with lightning season, and lightning was the ignition factor in nature to set the woods on fire. So that's a reasonable assumption. Uh, uh, that work incidentally was triggered by Mr. Stoddard's uh, uh, thoughts on the thing uh, for all of his life. In early tall timbers, uh, uh, we discussed things like that uh, for a long time, and uh, we found that we had a, uh, one scientist got on it and, and did a little work for two or three, four years, and found out that, that was true, so <laughs> it worked good. Now, in the forest, I showed you originally uh, a lot of tr trees, uh, a lot of uh, pictures of trees with a heavy, uh, heavy stand of timber. Those were unusual in the day. I showed the heaviest stocking of timber. Uh, a forest, in our judgment, uh, contains uh, a diversity of stocking, diversity of age classes, and I'll get into that in a little bit. But there are a lot of openings in the forest, in the, in the lonely pine forest. This is a bog. This is in the ecotone between the uh, upland, uh, there is a dry site, and the, and the creeks that are the wettest sites. Along the edge, if it's burned regularly and has been, you have a, a, an acid bog, 
with a tremendous variety of uh, diversity of life there, and unusual life that doesn't occur anywhere else in the forest except in these types, in these communities. Uh, there are a lot of uh, terrestrial orchids there, uh, a lot of uh, carnivorous plant, uh, plants, uh, 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 pitcher plants, uh, sundews, there's a world of them, all sorts. Uh, and this is a, a picture of uh, uh, these are some pitcher plants. Uh, we've got roughly two species, I think, in Thomas County that might possibly be a, another one or two, but we never found them. But anyway, this is one of the two species of pitcher plants. Uh, terrestrial orchids. Uh, I need, uh, I need my wife to tell us what it is. What is that one, Judy? Pleistees. Pleistees. Pleistees, that's right. This is a beautiful orchid, a terrestrial orchid, grows in bogs. Uh, now, this is a, uh, this is a, a, a calaroy, a, a wine cup is the common name for this plant. Uh, it's not um, uh, an endangered plant or anything, but it's very unusual in the Red Hills region. Uh, we know of two sites, and that doesn't mean that's all there is. We've got one site on Greenwood, a uh, natural site, and then a friend of ours who lived in Tallahassee uh, had a yard full of them that were there. And I think that was old Indian land, but anyway, it's, it's a beautiful plant, uh, Calaroy. Um, back to the bogs, this is, this is another uh, a, a orchid. This is a yellow-fringed orchid, and you can see the extent of them in that, in that area. It's one of the most beautiful uh, uh, areas. Uh, several of us in this room have seen this bog. Uh, and a close-up of the same bog. Uh, uh, that's the yellow French orchid. It's got a uh, cloudy southern butterfly on it, nectar on it. We have a white fringed orchid. Uh, it grows in the same type. Uh, you can't imagine the diversity of life. Now this is the same, not the same bog, but this is a similar ecotone in the fall of the year with an entirely different uh, uh, species of uh, plants blooming at this time. Now, uh, these uh, these scenes I just showed you, to put it in one respect, they didn't cost that land on a nickel. All he has to do is, is protect the forest from utter depletion and burn the woods and don't uh, destroy the land. That is, don't rut the land up or harrow it up or anything like that. And you, if you've got these eco, little uh, ecosystem little communities on, within the forest, uh, you, you can have them. All it takes is frequent fire. Now, this is some of the old field land. We've been looking at, at, at uh, what I call virgin land. Uh, this is Loblolly timber primarily here. And you see the antipoke on the broom sage grass. That's a pretty good indicator that, uh, that land's been disturbed. Uh, and incidentally, there's no hardwood encroachment in this area, so it's really beautiful. This is a good area, but this is a typical old field area. Um, we get native, we get natural gardens in those sites too. Uh, this is a, a lytris that occurs uh, both on virgin land and on uh, uh, old field land. <coughs> it blooms, it's starting to bloom now, it'll bloom in the fall. It coincides, as Julie found out, uh, with the uh, the last major flight of our swallowtail butterflies, and I think we've got seven species. And, uh, and this, this is almost as if these flowers were put there for them to nectar on. However, I'm sure that in the course of evolution, uh, they developed to nectar on the flowers. They, they saw the opportunity and, uh, and, uh, and took advantage of it. This is a state butterfly that, uh, that my wife had the honor of uh, helping to uh, get through. And uh, another shot of the light is, uh, uh, is a natural garden. And again, another one. Uh, just and all three of these were on different, different, different properties, uh, different sites. Now, another community that occurs. Now, I've got a message behind all this. If I can only make sure I get the point across to you, uh, if this were a commercial forest, this savannah would be bedded with a big machine and planted to slash pine or loblolly, and this savannah would not. It would be there, but not as a healthy part of the ecosystem. Uh, this is uh, a natural savanna, and you see the world of, uh, of vegetation out there, the world of life that occurs there. Uh, and uh, to follow through on that, there's one plant, the, uh, uh, 
the uh, Aglanus, uh, there's a pig blooming plant in there. You see a caterpillar right there. And uh, I'm, I'm stealing Julius' slides here. This is uh, uh, the caterpillar makes a buckeye butterfly. Now, uh, why is that important? It's important because it indicates that the ecosystem is healthy. And if the ecosystem is healthy, then it's taking care of itself because I can promise you, we don't know how to take care of it. We don't know what goes on out there yet. If we get enough people studying over a long enough period of time, they will work it out. But right now, we know very little about it. And, uh, uh, and so I think it's very important. This is another native uh, natural garden. And this I put this in, this is not in Thomas County, but it's very close. And uh, this is, uh, purple cone flower, which I'd never seen except in the garden, in the flower gardens around home where Julie plants them. Uh, again, our botanist friend Ag Angus Golson called us one day and invited us over and we trekked through a cut over timberland area uh, to the west I was here and, uh, and uh, this, this to a calcareous glade, which is a, a, an outcropping of lime rock uh, that covered about an acre and the lime rock was close enough to the surface that it actually ex was exposed in places, but there was six or eight inches of, of topsoil in spots. And this purple cone flower, was, which is a natural uh, 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 thing here of it being there, uh, it was just absolutely fantastic. You can't believe how beautiful it was. A world of, uh, of uh, butterflies won't get to. Uh, now, uh, if you burn the woods, if you own woods and burn the woods, and if they're, if they are, if you've got some good lands on it, and, and you, you don't have to have virgin timber and virgin land, you can start with anything. But if you keep burning your woods, the fire itself will define what is there. It will define uh, the communities that exist, whether it's a wetland community or a dry land community. And so, uh, uh, there's only one thing, you've got to factor time into the equation there. Now to get back to, uh, to the old field land, this is an old story of uh, Bob Lally and short leaf and, and some long leaf obviously. And what we do there, our forest management, for, for, uh, well for the last 75 years when, when Mr. Stoddard started, uh, his primary goal among other things, one of the primary goals, was to convert the land to longleaf if it was not already in longleaf, but you don't do that all at one time because the land was being used for a lot of other purposes, whale hunting, recreation, aesthetics, and so forth. And so whenever we had the opportunity with a seed crop, uh, particularly as time began to go by, uh, if we had a longleaf seed crop, we would stop the burning in here for one year, let it seed into longleaf, and then put a cool fire through the next year. And if we killed some of them, we would try to get with the next seed crop. Uh, we could not convert all of the land to pine trees because, again, the usage of the uh, of the land by the owners that did not require that, did not desire that. But we can convert to longleaf uh, and have done. We've gotten several million longleaf trees started in Thomas County over the last 50 years. Uh, just by doing this uh, uh, casual type uh, of uh, management. Uh, this is virgin land that was cut very heavy before it was acquired by an owner that wanted to take better care of it. Uh, we had a, a, a little bit better than a, what they call a seed tree stand, but we seeded that in the first seed crop, and we'll soon have so many trees there that we'll have to probably thin some out uh, from below. Uh, again, natural, natural regeneration within a stand of, uh, of uh, young, young longleaf. Now, again, uh, I want to emphasize we are managing for a multi-age structure in the forest. We don't always cut the biggest trees. We don't always cut the smallest. We cut the trees that need to come out from a health standpoint. And uh, by doing that, we end up with, uh, with a forest that is always, it always contains timber that you can convert to money if the markets are there. You never have to clear cut. You never have to do it. Uh, you never have to start from scratch and go through a period of 20 years before you can get the returns, financial returns from your money. The only thing we do, we do have it on a financial structure where we cut a portion of the increment 
the increment is the increase in value, and you only cut a portion out because if you start delving into principle, then you will run out. This is planted pine. Uh, right today, uh, uh, we, uh, it's very difficult to sell planted pine that uh, has been burned and has five scars on it with charcoal or is less than 20 years old. It's not impossible, but it's very difficult. Uh, I'm glad that I don't have all of my assets invested in five-year-old planted pines, for instance. Now, the state of nature lightning, as I mentioned, was a, was a cause of, uh, was the ignition factor for, for fires. And uh, this was a, a summer lightning strike, uh, blew up a hardwood, it set the woods on fire, uh, a beautiful burn, better than most people can do it, uh, uh, burning through young longleaf, it burned uh, about 100 acres before anybody knew it was there, didn't hurt a thing, in fact, we said burned the whole place that way. Um, now, to get the financial return, we marked the timber, and, uh, and we put a great deal of uh, emphasis on how we select trees to be marked. Uh, Mr. Stoddard would not let me uh, touch a paint gun other than to fill it up for him for the first couple of years that I worked for him. And, uh, and Paul Massey can say the same thing back there with me. Uh, but uh, we are very, very sincere about how we select trees to be marked. Uh, and we, we have a, a, a lot of criteria that we work on. Again, uh, we are striving for a healthy forest. That's the one thing. Now, that word is a catch word. It means a lot of things to a lot of people, but we want the ecosystem functioning forever. We cut logs, uh, poles, uh, pup wood, but we don't, we don't cut much short wood pup wood. That market's about gone, and it's going to be a tremendous blow to conservation to lose the short wood market because we use that to clean up the woods uh, and, uh, and, and we've sold thousands and thousands and thousands of cords of it. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I hate to lose that. This is, uh, this is a, a recent timber operation that we had. Uh, uh, we've got at least two men in the room that have cut a lot of timber for me and I really can't tell which one cut this one uh, they both are so good, they both log so well that it's a sort of a horse race between them. Uh, that's uh, Bob Balfour and Victor Beatles. Uh, I can't remember, but they both do excellent work, and I'm proud of them and I want them to continue to do that because uh, that has made a big contribution to, uh, to the uh, uh, conservation aspect of, of, of this system of forestry. And, uh, of course, the pictures in Moses, so I don't Send, sell him too much. He's got. He, he owns the other part of the state over there. So, uh, <laughs> when we select trees, we've got red cockaded woodpeckers, which is a federally endangered species. We've had them. I've had the biggest population of, of woodpeckers on private lands of anybody in the country right here. Uh, we begin to lose them though, as in the last few years, as uh, ownerships change and so forth and so on. But we certainly. Uh, uh, cognizant of the woodpeckers we have, we know where they are. If we thin through here, we would do it very carefully. That's the woodpecker tree right there. As you can see a, a light gray streak up and down the trunk there. That's the pitch flow that the woodpeckers put in. Um, a beautiful tree like this, which is totally mature in most foresters' vines, we wouldn't cut that tree for anything. Uh, they're the ones that we don't have but a few left in the whole wide world, and it'd be like killing the last uh, elephant or something. I don't know. Uh, which is brooms. Uh, now, uh, uh, these, these are the types of things, it only as an illustration of what we take into effect. A uh, witch's broom is a, a, an ab a pathological abnormality there, uh, but I'm not even sure it's pathological, but it's, it's, a, it's a, 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 a disorder there in, in, the, in the growth structure. But it's a fantastic wildlife area. Now, you can't believe what uses it. I've seen five raccoons go up a tree and go in a witch's broom and disappear. Owls use them, small birds roost in them, all sorts of things. They're not that many to make any great deal of difference, but the fact that you've got them, uh, why get rid of them if you don't need to? Uh, 
<coughs> ultimately the tree will have to go if it doesn't if it's not hit by light. Um, a, a hardwood tree this happens to be a big spark of berry that's Angus and Judy. Um, uh, we protect trees like this all over, off-site trees. Uh, that's an interesting tree. This this is a short leaf that uh, is overgrown by the hardwoods behind it. It's an abnormal tree as far as growth is concerned. It has no real commercial uh, future. Uh, ecologically, uh, from a distance, I said, well, that's not anything. I go down there and mark that tree, and uh, you can see a little spot there. As I got closer, I saw something on it. As I got real close, I looked, and this, this, uh, 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 this is on a marking tree for a black bear. Uh, this is posted sign. He's saying, keep out of here. This belongs to me. When I walked up the road, very quietly and very carefully. <laughs> and uh, the road went right down to the side of the branch. There was a, 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 a switch cane a thicket there, a London area thicket, and uh, with a good game trail. And I was trying to get disappear from that area. I was trying to get out of, out of the problem, you know, the problem area. And something caught my attention right down there. And the bear had been to this tree, and he was going down the trail. He raised up and looked at me over the cane, and the cane was about six feet high. He said, woof. In case y'all don't know bad language, that means don't cut my tree. <laughs> so I didn't cut it. <laughs> but those are the things that we, we, we feel add uh, not only interest, uh, uh, but uh, it adds uh, uh, diversity. Uh, if we cut that tree, that bear would get him another tree. But there wasn't any reason the tree was healthy in the last time. This is a, an upland black gum tree that makes tremendous fruit if it's a female. In the fall of the year, right now, those black gum trees are loaded with fruit. We saw some yesterday. They're beginning to fall. The migratory, uh, uh, neotropical migratory birds are coming through right now. They love black gum. Uh, they feed a tremendous number of birds. Uh, you know, when birds migrate uh, south, uh, most of our birds cross the Gulf of Mexico over water uh, uh, and uh, spend the winter in, in southern Mexico, Central America, and South America. Uh, if you think about it, you know, they don't pack their bags and buy an airline ticket and worry about whether they should get on that plane or not because so many of them have been falling. Uh, they just fly on from the north down through here and across the Gulf of Mexico taking what comes. Now they do pack their bags though because they lay on, lay on a tremendous amount of fat in the process of moving through this part of the country and that fat sustains them if it takes three or four or five days to cross the Gulf of Mexico because they got no place to stop. And uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of our ornithologists, ornithologist, uh, uh, a lot of the scientists have weighed them before and after and, and they burn that fat up just like an airplane burns the gas out of its tank. And uh, so in any event, it's, it's, if we don't have something for them to lay the fat on with, then they're not going to make it. This is, a, this is an interesting one. Um, uh, again, you see that we don't, we don't cut trees just because they are old and just because the growth rings are close together. Uh, uh, this is on the Mill Pond Plantation. Uh, these old flat top long leaf, I've worked through them myself. Uh, uh, three, three or four times, uh, uh, and always left these trees. They were healthy. They're not growing the way that the modern forest profession tells you they ought to grow, but they're growing some. Uh, we, uh, we, uh, this is uh, close to the duck pond. We managed the mill pond for a few years. Uh, Paul and I did. Uh, we put the duck pond back in shape. Got a good number of ducks coming in, and we immediately attracted a couple of bald eagles in the winter time. And we knew, we felt sure they were going to nest there because it was so regular every winter. And there was a big old loblolly down close to the pond. I mean, big 120-foot uh, tall loblolly I had picked out to where they might nest. Lo and behold, they flew a half mile on top of the hill and got in these old, old long leaf. And if that's not a, uh, if that's not a, uh, a good reason to leave, leave long leaf, I don't know what it is. That's a, a all they do there, sad. You can't see it. I'm sorry. It, uh, Better, but it's an active nest. It's been active for several years now. It's producing a lot of young, not a lot, but several young over most years. And the reason we, uh, one reason we left them is that uh, 
uh, if you look at the structure of that tree and that tree with the limbs, it's conducive to holding a nest, whether it's a horned owl's nest, or a red-tailed hawk nest, or an eagle nest, uh, or a fox squirrel nest. And uh, so by leaving it, uh, and that eagle choosing it, uh, uh, it, uh, it made us feel good. Dead trees, I was asked about dead trees. We don't salvage all the dead trees, but we do have a salvage uh, operation that we try to come through. We get excellent uh, cooperation from our utilization uh, people from the mills. Um, dead trees, these are some dead hard pines. We developed a market for that uh, 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 after many, many years. I've got to digress for a moment here from the slides and tell you about a very interesting thing that, that we had going. Uh, and, uh, and I believe it was 1978, uh, uh, Mr. Percy Chubb and Mr. Tom Chubb, uh, you all know uh, the Chubbs in Thomasville. Tom was the father of Russell and, and Rosie Davis and Vicki Woodsfeld, uh, and Percy was his brother. Uh, they both owned properties, including Springwood, and uh, Percy was uh, uh, at that time a very active, a very active sailor uh, for pleasure. Uh, he had a, a pretty good boat. He uh, owned an island in the Caribbean, and, and he sailed all over the world. Uh, and he was commodore of the New York Yacht Club. And, uh, and incidentally, I'll digress again. Tom, who uh, I worked for, was, uh, was uh, uh, his friend and agent and so forth. Uh, Tom uh, called me one day and said, uh, uh, I've got an idea I want to run by you. I want to start a yacht club in Thomasville. I said, great. Uh, so that was the first step of forming the Beeston Yacht Club. Uh, Tom wanted to be the Commodore of a yacht club while his brother Percy was Commodore of the, you know, the New York Yacht Club. <laughs> but uh, in any event, uh, Percy had, uh, had just uh, donated the money to build a Chubb Wharf at Mystic, Connecticut, uh, the Seaport Museum, and uh, a member of the Board of Trustees, Mr. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Waldo Howland, uh, contacted uh, he was a friend of Percy's and a member of the New York Yacht Club too. He called, he talked to Percy one day and Percy had a little track of virgin longleaf, about five acres that had maybe 30 or 40 old growth trees on it. And they wanted some old growth pine timber for the pranking and so forth of some of the boats up there in Connecticut and uh, that they were restoring. Well, uh, all of this led to many, many meetings and conversations and, and a lot of uh, investigation. We were not able to do anything at that time with Percy's timber because uh, none of the trees really qualified. But in the course of the next three or four years, we were able to uh, locate and uh, with the help of Bob Balfour, who's in this room, uh, Bob is an outstanding citizen of this community, as you all know. I don't have to say anything about that. But uh, for many, many years, if I needed anything uh, along this line, I'd go to Bob and he would uh, eagerly uh, eagerly uh, uh, help in any way he could. Well, we were able to find uh, 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 several, several loads of old growth longleaf that was either in the process of maybe salvaged from lightning struck trees or in the case of being clear cut for one reason or another out of necessity here or there. And uh, uh, we, uh, we were able to uh, borrow one of uh, Bob's uh, loggers, uh, utilize his, uh, his foresters, and, uh, and uh, Bob uh, uh, let us uh, load the uh, stuff uh, on his yard and he loaded them on the cars for us and we sent them up there. Anyway, uh, this was all uh, as a gift from Bob to, uh, to Misty. And we sent them, I guess, maybe close, uh, close to about 75, 80,000 board feet of hard long leaf, which is a pretty good volume. Um, then uh, they sent word down one day, they said, we need some live oak. And uh, I said, great, we've we got plenty of live oak. And you know, live oak is a weed species in some parts of our country now, not as a beautiful tree that we use for aesthetics. And uh, I just had visualized, uh, I visualized some old uh, scrubby trees that we could cut a little log out of, you know, whatever they wanted. He said, we need a live oak that will square 26 by 26 inches at the butt. That's no problem, we got big live oak. It's got a square 16 by 16 at the top, so that's no problem, you know, 8 or 10 feet. And it's got to be 25 feet long. 
<laughs> have, have you ever seen a line that you cut a 25 foot straight log that big out of? And I, I said, my goodness alive, uh, let me get to work. So I called everybody I knew and uh, uh, all of the foresters, uh, went over to the Apache River Swamp and contacted uh, uh, those people logging all up and down over there. Everybody said, yeah, I got all of those you need. By the time we checked them out, it was nowhere close. But then after about a year and a half, uh, Bob's forester, Sonny Lee, who had been alerted and was on the lookout, uh, Sonny called me and he said, my daddy's found one of those trees right back at his house. Well, this is right over here, in, actually in Grady County. And uh, so we checked it out, and not only was there one there, there were two there. But in any event, it was on land that Harry T. Jones owned. And uh, we called Harry, Harry said, oh, uh, how much you gonna give me for him? <laughs> <laughs> we, we talked in about two seconds. We talked Harry into donating the trees to Mystic for which he got uh, uh, a lot of uh, thanks and so forth. And uh, so <clears throat> Bob sent his crew out there. They logged it. Uh, uh, it was written up in uh, <clears throat> Wooden Boat Magazine. Uh, and uh, we set the stern post of the Morgan up there. Now the Charles W. Morgan is the first, uh, the only whale, wooden whale ship left in the world. And it was uh, built about 1840, 160 years ago, sailed all over the world. It's, it's got a vivid history. It sailed it whaled in every ocean there is, I think. It was birthed at Bedford, uh, New Bedford, and uh, also for a while it was birthed on the, on the Pacific coast. But it ended up back on the East Coast, and somehow or another it was uh, came into possession of the uh, of the Mystic uh, Seaport. And we have sent them uh, again, primarily through the cooperation of Bob Balfour. We have sent them a world of uh, uh, hard pine lonely for the planking, uh, the uh, di uh, the stern post, and some other live oak to go on the Morgan. And uh, uh, Tom's got a. Uh, uh, they sent me uh, a chunk of live oak out of the original water, in other words, out of the boat that was, uh, uh, I mean, the original structure of the boat built in 1840. It was logged on the Atlantic coast uh, at that time, even probably in uh, Georgia or South Carolina, the live oak was, but uh, it's sitting right over here. But that, if you see it, that thing is just as heavy as it was the day it was cut. And uh, that's why they used live oak, of course. But uh, in any event, it was a great experience. Uh, that lasted several years by the time we were all furnishing everything for them. And, uh, and it was a great deal of fun, a great deal of pleasure. But uh, then about a, a few, few months later, I got a call from uh, a man named uh, John Coates, Sir John Coates, a naval architect in London. And they were working on a reconstructing a boat called a trireme, a Greek vessel, there no plans for it, only, only uh, what I'll say, pictures, uh, reliefs on vases and things like that of this trireme. It was an oared boat about 45 feet long, and uh, uh, it was a war vessel as well as a commercial vessel, I think. <clears throat> but in any event, uh, John Coates had contacted Mystic and they had put him on me, they said, yeah, those folks down there in Thomasville can furnish you anything you want. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, again, we prevailed on Bob. We, in this case, what they wanted was, uh, this boat was built 6,000 years ago or something like that, uh, 3,000 BC, maybe 5,000 years ago. It was wooden, and uh, they did not use metal. They didn't have nails, I guess. Uh, they devised a locking system like a Chinese puzzle to lock the planking on the deck. Now they did peg some of it, but they, they locked the boards together. And they made that out of Mediterranean oak. And I don't have the name of that little piece of material. The finished material was an irregular sawed, uh, 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 structured thing. Uh, about four inches by four inches and maybe two inches uh, thick. And like I say, they locked the, the, the planks together. And the guy wanted 17,000 of them, and, uh, uh, which we couldn't finish. Uh, but uh, I told 
Sir John Coates that we couldn't do that, but we could send some rough, uh, rough live oak, I felt sure. And he said, well, you'll just have to talk to Admiral so-and-so. Well, Admiral so-and-so was an admiral in the Hellenic Navy, and he couldn't speak much English, and I sure couldn't speak much Greece, <laughs> Greek. And so the way I communicated with him, I went up and got George Mathis to handle, handle the conversation. <laughs> And once we got the order in, I went to Bob and uh, we, I, I got the book in there and he saw it and he loaded on a, a, on a, 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 a truck and we sent it to Jacksonville where it was offloaded to and shipped to Greece. But things like that are very interesting. Thomasville uh, has connections, as you know, not only in this respect, but in all our respects, all over the world, worldwide. This material is a hard pine. It, uh, uh, we, uh, we don't cut much hard pine anymore alive, but we will salvage some. It's so valuable. Uh, one of these trees, on the average, we can get the money from one of these trees and it would take three common live trees, not hard pine live trees, but three, three ordinary ones, to, uh, to get to us. That allows us to leave some trees a little bit longer, let them get to be bigger and better. Another thing we do with Mark Timber, if we find something of, of, uh, of any value, uh, historical, uh, 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 biological, whatever, uh, we'll flag it off, uh, reproduction, and we don't be unreasonable with it, but uh, this was a pinewood sparrow nest, a bird that's very rare now because the ecosystem is rare. Uh, I found that when we were logging, we put a flag around it, and uh, you see that we are right in the middle of the ramp. They ramped all the way around it. That little bird hatched off. And three healthy young ones, uh, it's very nice. Now, we're getting down. When I was a boy, uh, this was in the 30s, Pine Tree Boulevard looked very much like this from the Monticello Highway all the way around to the Marble Plantation. And uh, then the other side was wooded also, but because of the past human history, it didn't have the older, bigger trees. It had a lot of timber all the way around. It's called Pine Tree Boulevard for a good reason. And, uh, and uh, this is, uh, this is a, a shot I made a couple of days ago. Now, this is a shot to, to, to show you, and you all know this, uh, I was standing right there across the railroad track on the, on the northwest side of the railroad track of the railroad crossing Pine Tree Boulevard going to Metcalf. And this is the uh, entrance to the uh, uh, to the uh, emergency management section at, at Finney at uh, Southwestern. Southwestern's all back in there, you see. And, uh, and when I first saw this, when I was old enough uh, to recognize it, it looked just like this previous shot did uh, 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 a while ago. Uh, this is a little bit further down the road. That's the uh, GBI headquarters. The woodpeckers are all in here. They're gone now. Uh, this is the intersection of 319 and uh, and uh, uh, Pine Tree Boulevard uh, across 319 from where we are standing. That was El Soma Plantation. That was the main house and uh, 400 acres of land of old growth on the magnificent, beautiful forest. Uh, Inwood was on the left over here, and right back over, over here off of the boulevard uh, was uh, a, an old field that has grown up in the uh, houses and now <coughs> houses and, and long, young Longley. But, that's where S. Prentiss Baldwin, Baldwin in uh, about uh, 1918, came down to visit, uh, uh, I believe, Mr. Ely, who owned Inwood. And for entertainment, he was an amateur ornithologist. He banded some birds. He developed a little trap, a little bird trap, and banded birds there. And what he discovered in two or three years was that some of the same birds that he banded one year would come back the next year. Now, that was a great scientific discovery. But that fact alone, the fact that Mr. Baldwin uh, uh, banded birds here, and nothing had ever been done like that before in the history of Thomas and of Noah, that was one of the things that instigated the original quail study that brought Herbert Stoddard to Thomasville, Georgia. And that's an in, just an interesting fact I thought I'd share with you. Uh, this is the old, uh, the only thing left on, uh, on uh, El Soma there is the uh, Oak tree lined, Bible lined, main drive, beautiful drive. This was virgin, uh, 
Virgin Mountain on both sides of that drive there. Um, you see a few remnant trees that they left, probably left them a little ago, but uh, it was a beautiful, beautiful long leaf forest. It's gone now. Uh, there was wild grass out in these areas just up. This is where the Jack Mavic station is, and uh, it's only recently been built in the last few years. There was wild grass still left out here up until a few years ago when they mowed it so much that it, of course, it most they did away with it. Um, I want to show this one, if you all are familiar with this, this is right on down to, in front of Sing Singletary's house down there. And Thomas County paved this road, I think, in a magnificent way. They wanted to come in and put a 100-foot right-of-way there, clear it totally, and put a, a wide road. And I don't think it was necessary at that time. I know that, uh, but I don't know why we can't have a, a few more roads like this in vital spots around. But I want to congratulate the county right there. They did one for us on Mill Pond, on Mill Pond Road, for a short way, just very similar to this. And I'm proud of the county for doing that. Uh, back to uh, this is Box Hall on the left, but all this whole area from the railroad track right on through was one continuous stand of Longley, just different ownerships in there. Uh, we're going now across the railroad, going uh, uh, still northwest on Pine Tree Boulevard. Uh, it's just a magnificent drive. Uh, and that drive is a public drive. Anytime you all want to go out there and look at it, go out there and look at it. You'll be amazed at how beautiful it is. Now, other than the normal civilized uh, growth, and uh, which may lead to the destruction of a lot of our so-called wildland, we have uh, also uh, uh, natural forces at work. In 1971, we had a pretty severe, what we call a tornado come through. It was not exactly a tornado, it was a, a front with a wind shear uh, situation there. We had several little tornadoes come down, and uh, uh, this shows you some of the destruction. That's Roy Kamara there, and that's Ed Kamara there, and those two gentlemen are uh, uh, ecologists from uh, one's from Rhodesia and one's from South Africa. Tall Timbers was hosting the, uh, uh, I've forgotten the number, a fire ecology conference on, on Africa. This was in 1971. And uh, Mrs. Bolton, Claire Jonkins' mother, who owned Melrose Plantation, and was a very fine supporter of Tall Timbers, uh, she uh, uh, hosted a dinner party on this particular night. I believe it was April the 4th or something like that. But in any event, uh, this thing came through at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. We would do that at 6.30. Uh, Judy and I left out. We did it on Mr. Starr's property. We left home, and we were aware that a storm had come by, but uh, we didn't know how severe it was. And got up behind this old gas tank. Uh, the uh, traffic was stopped because trees were across the road for oh, a mile or more. And uh, we had to wait until they opened it up uh, so we could get on down to Melrose. This is Melrose on this side, Central over here. And uh, we had Ed and them got there first, so we met them there. And uh, we went on down, turned in the service drive at Melrose, in case maybe some of you all remember this. But this was, uh, this was blocked, of course, by that big tree. We had to take a couple of the planks down and drive across the lawn, dodging uh, the lambs and all, to get to the Melrose house. And we got there. And Mrs. Bolton put on the finest dinner party you ever saw. Never missed a beat. Uh, the food was hot, fresh cooked. Uh, the, uh, the drinks were cold. Uh, she had a backup for everything there. She had a gas, gas backup for her electrical. But everything was out with the telephone. And uh, we, she had a, it was just a wonderful evening, an amazing evening, just because of the, the hardship under which she did that. Um, you can just see the instruction. I salvaged, uh, and, and uh, Bob and Victor played a tremendous part in this. Uh, we uh, we salvaged, uh, we, Mr. Starr and I, uh, salvaged uh, almost exactly 10 million board feet of, of timber that was blown down and broken off by that storm. We had to call all of our friends. We, Victor spent a better part of a year over here, Bob was here already, but it took a long time, it took a year and a half to clean it up, but uh, we, we were able to uh, call on our friends and they responded tremendously. But you see the damage, uh, and uh, it went on and on. This is, uh, and I flew it uh, two days later uh, to try to get the, uh, 
the scope of the damage to know what I had to do. Incidentally, the night of the dinner party, I got on that telephone and I lined up the logging crews right there because I knew what was on the ground to a certain extent. And, uh, and uh, uh, so uh, that, that secured it. This is Pebble Hill from the air, uh, right next door to Melrose. It, it dodged Pebble Hill as far as severe destruction. Uh, this is between Pebble Hill and Melrose, but you can see from the air what it did. And, and uh, it was just a, a, an amazing event. Very interesting. We had, uh, we've had Hurricane King came in. We got about 8 million feet salaries from our properties over of that. Uh, we've had other storms come through. But again now, you probably couldn't tell if we had storm damage out there if you were not there today because we maintain a forest. We don't ever lose our forest, even with destruction like this. Now, some of the spots were pretty bad, but we didn't. We don't go in and clear cut and replant and all. They shot quills next year and all that sort of thing. Well, I, I think I probably bored you enough. I'm going to stop with Herbert Stoddard burning the woods. And I'm going to tell you one more story about him. Uh, I was, uh, he was 60 years old when I went to work for him, and we formed a partnership five years later, and, uh, and I was, I think, 22. Julie and I had uh, been married a couple of years, and no, not that. And Mr. Stoddard, uh, he wore cotton work pants. Uh, we wear them out pretty fast, so he, uh, they were we all, pretty cheap, no need to wear any expensive pants. And they would get frayed around the edges because of the rise. And uh, so one of my jobs when we were burning, I'd just keep my eye on him because a lot of times he'd step over there and wish I'd get caught on fire, I'd have to put him out. <laughs> and as soon as he got put out, he'd keep on setting fire. So. <laughs> but that's it. And I certainly appreciate it, and I've enjoyed it being with you, and I hope I hadn't bored you. Sure, you're going to have some questions, Leon. Stay up, please. But uh, before you do the questions, uh, Leon's been practicing forestry here for longer than well before I was born. So he, he, that deserves some recognition. And if Leon's our number one forester, Earl Bennett is our number two forester, and I want Earl to come over and uh, make a presentation to Leon at this time. Then after this, you, you can have some questions, and then we'll turn it back over to Ann. <laughs> well, it's boring. <laughs> we foresters don't make money. I want you to remember that last scene of where Mr. Stoddard was burning. Then Mr. Neal didn't tell you about the fire plot, but it was invented a few years before, and he's been using it ever since. Just keep that in mind. The Society of American Foresters, which Lynn has been a member for 50 years, is an organization of uh, professional foresters. 17,000 over the United States and Canada. And it's an organization just like uh, your medicine, your attorneys, and so forth. It's a professional organization which we're very proud of. Leon joined it in 1950, and this year it makes him 50 years of being in that organization. And also this is the centennial year of the Society of American Foresters, which is 100 years. So it's very fitting that we give him a certificate that says he has been around that long, <laughs> and that uh, he has contributed, and I shall read to the membership and the contribution of advance in uh, the science, and technology, education, and the practice of professional forestry in America, signed by Frederick W. Ebel, President, which is the organization that has uh, the America, which is our national headquarters. So, Julie, why don't you come up here and uh, help him share this honor? And uh, it, it's a mighty nice award. 
Yeah. It's a good award for uh, this organization, which he represents. And on behalf of the president of the Society of American Forestry, all the foresters, Southeast and Georgia, and the SAF members here, that you will just token this Thank you. Thing, that fire pot is ancient. The fact that I know he still uses it, and he likes it, and he probably won't give it away, but I thought if we'd give him a new fire pot, he'd donate that to the Tom Scott Museum. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be historic. So a group of us foresters went together, and we bought a new fire pot. <laughs> It's known, as, it's, only, it's known as a drip torch. And uh, being back in that six years, it's kind of high tech. <laughs> and uh, it operates something like this. We uh, were going to get a longer snout on it, so you wouldn't have to bend over, but it's $10 more than that. <laughs> <laughs> so we present this to you, and uh, if you want to retire to Old Park, fine. fine. If you don't, Regardless of what we start with, uh, and it, what we start with does make a tremendous difference. The more timber we have on the ground, the more we can cut. But regardless of what we start with, uh, our cutting is limited to what needs to be removed for the overall health of the forest, including the economic health. Now, that's a I said a mouthful there, it's very complicated. Uh, uh, but again, I go back, the more you have, the more you can cut uh, and take your dividends, so to speak, out of the stand of timber without destroying the, the stand of timber. 
And this works with pulp wood uh, from first tenons on right on through 400 year old trees. Uh, uh, then, to, when we make the decision to cut something, though, number one, we've got to have enough. We've got to cut enough to sell. We can't expect the uh, uh, the sawmill people and the pulpwood people uh, to uh, come in and buy something that's not worth logging from a volume standpoint. Uh, so we try to accumulate uh, enough to do that. Uh, but we we mark trees based on their individual health, their individual condition. Uh, everything about individual trees, we make a choice as to which one we should take and which one we should, which ones we should leave. Uh, it's uh, that's about the best I can do to describe it. They're trying to quantify that at the Jones Center right now. They're not having much luck because uh, it doesn't fit into a box. Uh, we practice adaptive management. Uh, if we see something that needs to be done, we want to do it. We don't want to wait until next year or something. Uh, so. Um, I think that's called adaptive management today, and uh, uh, if you got good judgment, you can do that. I think and, but maybe that helps you a little bit. Johnny, Liam, when we have natural disasters like Kate, one of the things I noticed with all the trees over was the the large trees with the shallow root system seemed to be consistent with the trees that had fallen. Had that root system deteriorated, or is that typical of? Uh, other than the bark pine tree? Uh, probably a little bit of both, Johnny. Uh, age, I think, uh, is uh, like uh, a lot of things, uh, including us here, the older we get, the, uh, the more we fall apart, you know. But uh, uh, I think that's uh, uh, a little bit of both there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, what about gopher tortoises? You didn't mention those much as far as... Well, yeah, we got gopher tortoises. We, uh, we try to take care of them. Uh, 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 we certainly, we flag gopher tortoise uh, uh, burrows and uh, uh, try to protect them, you know, when we're logging, that sort of thing. What about diamond bat rattlesnakes that are associated with the... Uh, yeah, of, that's right. See, that's one of the, that's one of the things. Nature is not something. I mean, but do you do you protect the diamond back at any point, or are they just killed on site? I, mean, I, did, I didn't understand that. Are the, the diamond backs just killed on site, or are they, are they given any protection at all as far as their association with the uh, gopher tortoise? Well, they, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people don't like diving bags. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, I must say, uh, I've let some of them go, but now around, around my house where my grandchildren come and our friends come and so forth, uh, I try to dispatch them if I can. But uh, uh, they are, we, we don't want to kill the last diamond back. Uh, we want them around neighborhood land or something, you know. <laughs> but they, they are part of the ecosystem and they, and they're closely related to gopher tortoises as far as they, their demands are concerned. They well, there's tortoises. a lot of other creatures too. I mean, oh, there are a lot of other creatures. With, think, the, with the gopher tortoise. Yeah, gopher I think tortoise. there's uh, 17 <coughs> species of herps that are associated with the gopher tortoise. Bur birds and nowhere else, I believe. Oh, herps and insects. Yeah. Yeah. Say something about that oak, the first oak you mentioned. How far south did that go? Is that one of the talking? Yeah, it, it goes down into Florida. Uh, uh, of course, Florida, you know, the physiographic region has changed. You get down about uh, somewhere down there around Gainesville, there's about when there's a lot of species start petering out there and don't occur further south. I don't know exactly what the range is. There's another species that becomes more common on the Appalachian National Forest. It's another dwarf over called uh, minimum, workers minimum. But uh, it's, it's common. You know, well, well, it, uh, it, it's, yeah, it, uh, it, it occurs on the, uh, in the same habitat uh, as turkey oak, except turkey oak will also occur on dry sites in, in, in the forest uh, it, It's a natural hardwood in a long leaf ecosystem. It fits in well. You're not going to kill it with fire. So uh, we utilize it, you know. I don't know if you serious thing and, and uh, uh, Herbert Stoddard and Mr. Beale and Ed Kumar established tolls and was primary to uh, uh, to call attention to the value of fire as an ecological tool and as a management tool. Uh, now uh, and, and we pretty well did that uh, 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 for uh, 
few years before Ed died, the Forest Service had conceded that there was a place for controlled burning in the forest now. The first time in the history of mankind that the Forest Service ever said that. They still, they still can't get it out of their minds that fire is bad. Now, the first thing I've got to say, though, fire in the West is entirely different from fire in Thomasville, Georgia. Uh, the uh, uh, humidity uh, ranges are much, much less out there. Uh, the rainfall is less, the winds are greater. Uh, the, the, uh, the vegetation is more combustible. It's full of volatile oil. You've only got a few of volatile oils out there. But now the key to it is, uh, and the Forest Service is finally coming around, they said, well, we've got to thin out our timber stands, which is true. If they'd been burning, they wouldn't have to thin out the timber stands, I would say. So they really hadn't admitted that. But now I'll also say, I saw Dr. Uh, Harold Biswell, who was at Tifton, Georgia, for a number of years as a research witness and uh, became a professor of forestry at Berkeley. And we had a fire conference out there. And Dr. Biswell put on a controlled burn uh, in the mountains of, of uh, Northern California, across, uh, uh, across the bay from San Francisco. The neatest controlled burn I ever saw in my life. He used natural features to stop the fire, never had any problem, but a perfect burn. So it can be done. I know it can be done. Judy and I have done some work in New Mexico, and we introduced uh, this system. They do they burn out there, but they do, we introduced this system of uh, thinning your timber stands properly, and it's catching hold about that pretty good. And, uh, uh, but now Florida's the one we've got to watch out for. And then right here in Thomasville, Georgia, I know a few places that we have a catastrophe fire. Uh, some house, one or two houses would be in danger, that is, in, in the, not in town. Uh, but Florida is almost like the rest in a lot of respects, but we've got a lot more humidity in Florida, and they can, uh, they can, can control the dangers of wildfire by instigating uh, and nothing else. They stay all the way out of the system, but they go up and burn it in. That's a complex system, not a situation where. Okay, thank you.